the networks would open for um, open for business, um, and at that time there was a tremendous. I mean, the, the volume was amazing. Almost, oh my gosh, I would say almost three times what it is now, um, um, because Fox had just Fox had just launched as a network. Um, obviously, they were very aggressive at looking for new product. So the the networks would open traditionally around. July, and they would be open for business. And the selling season went somewhere from mid-July all the way until, I would say, late September, early October at that time. Um, and you had to, um, you know, you had to develop your pitches. Um, and I was a real stickler for the process of pitching. Um, I was, you know, I, I now when, when executives come in to pitch, they're not as sort of a part of the pitch. Maybe I just was a, a busy buzzy and, and I felt very, um, you know, I felt beholden to the writers and not all writers are great pitchers. You know, those skill sets are somewhat, um, you know, they're antithetical to each other. Um, being a writer and being able to pitch sometimes you know, they're, they're challenging. Um, so I would do the preamble before the pitch, be there with the writer to sort of help out if there were things that we'd, you know, we'd rehearsed a number of times before we went into pitch. Um, um, so I had a process. I had, um, there were certain things that I would, you know, I was a real stickler for, like we would never leave pages behind. You never, um, you know, a good 10 minute pitch, a 15 minute pitch at the most, that was the most effective. Um, and to keep, keep, help keep the writer kind of on track if there were times where they would veer off into a, a you know, a tangent. Um, but I would sort of pre-clear an area with the, with the network executive before so the writer knew before he or she went in, um, you know, any kind of inside information that, that would help them with the pitch. Then if we were going to a different network, um, we might have to augment the pitch, modify it in some way that was better suited for another network. Um, I really felt that my job at that point was was making and creating um, the best environment for the writer to pitch. Um, and and selling was, again, selling was in my blood. So um, I, I felt that that it was it was, you know, it was it was my job to to bring in the perfect pitch and to help that network, um, you know, to make it impossible for the network to say no. Did you ever uh, kind of navigate a bidding war on any series that you remember? Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, there were, um, you know, a number of, of projects and writers. I mean, one of the writers that uh, I am fortunate enough to work with to, to this day, Barbara Hall, uh, was a writer I worked with at Warner Brothers. Um, John McNamara was a writer that I worked with at Warner Brothers. Um, several of their projects, um, they, were, they were well sought after, um, and several of their projects you know, we, we would. But, you know, it it was interesting. Um, there seemed to be a uh, more of a contrast uh, between the network's taste, what their brand was in those days. That's changed dramatically um, um, today. And so if something was, you would really uh, uh, craft a pitch that was perfectly suited for a particular network. So you, 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 I, I want to say there was a kind of honor system, and if you promise something to uh, Greer Shepard was the executive at ABC that I would sell to. Kevin Riley was the executive I would sell to at NBC. Uh, Fox was Bob Greenblatt, um, and CBS was Jonathan Levin. So um, I, you know, I worked very closely with them to really identify what they were looking for. Jonathan Levin at CBS at the time was, was and is to this day a big reader, so he liked to develop a lot of books. Um, but really getting, um, getting the lay of the land from that network executive really helped hone the pitch and craft the pitch uh, with the writers before we went in. Well, it was interesting because um, uh, the, I was at a studio 
Um, once you sold your pilot and once you got, uh, you were in development, you know, I was working very closely with the writer and with the network and making sure that, that what the network n- was requesting in terms of notes, changes, et cetera, that, you know, th- they were very specific and I was able to, uh, liaison with the writer to make sure the notes were addressed to the network satisfaction, to make sure that the elements that that network was looking for, i.e. in the form of a director or an actor, that I could begin packaging, if you will, um, that pilot to make it um, a hot property at the network. Um, at that point, the networks kind of kept a, you know, very much to themselves. I mean, they didn't share a lot of information in those days, so you really had to, to do reconnaissance and, and, and get as much information as you possibly could. Um, in terms of scheduling, um, one of the things that, and this is where, again, I learned from my boss, um, once that pilot was shot, um, and getting as many pilots shot was really important. Um, and once Leslie was, again, he was running the studio at the time, um, he was a top producer. So we were selling the most. We were getting the most pilots picked up. We had the most series on the air at the time. Um, but in terms of scheduling, you know, that was kind of the network's responsibility. But Leslie um, was, who was the consummate, salesman and is to this day, um, we would make suggestions to the network. So um, if we had a pilot shot, uh, you know, part of getting that pilot picked up to series was saying and identifying that pilot is a great companion piece for an existing series that was already on the air at at the respective network. Um, So he was definitely distinguishing himself as as someone who was as smart, if not smarter, than a lot of the people who are at the networks um, and and providing viable uh, sales information um, to ultimately get that, that pilot picked up to series.